we've got this idea with respect to UFOs. Uh, this is, a lot of you will be very familiar with this. You could probably fill in a blank other than UFOs with some of the topics we've heard this weekend, but talk about UFOs. So UFOs can exist, therefore they don't. That's the given. The corollary, corollary of course, is that humans could not possibly be abducted by air, aliens, therefore they, are, they aren't. And of course, when you have that type of thinking, that type of mindset, it completely circumvents and closes off any additional serious research because there's nothing to research. You know the answer before you start. And this is, of course, is a problem, as I said, with many of the topics this weekend. Uh, but I might, uh, I dare say that it, perhaps it is especially true with the question of alien abductions, or if you will, alien abduction syndrome. We have another little problem here. And this ties into Professor Westrom's talk to some degree. Talks about, talk about my colleagues. My colleagues uh, don't take this uh, very seriously, most of them, because they might argue it sounds just like another case of hysteria. It sounds all too familiar to many of my colleagues in the mental health field. You know, been there, done that. Heard about this before. You know, to what degree is behavior a function of cultural? cultural competence, or, excuse me, cultural cognizance, cultural awareness. We've seen this type of thing before, where something that's virtually unheard of, all of a sudden, before you know it, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So back in the 1980s, um, Satan appeared to be running rampant in the United States and having his way with many of our children. Um, there were a number of things that created this satanic hysteria and this great concern about satanic ritual abu abuse. Uh, and one of them was the book uh, Michelle Remembers, which generally has been found to be fraudulent. It's written by a psychiatrist, though, so, you know, it's got to be uh, credible, right, because the psychiatrist wrote it. And it's a story of a child who was uh, exposed to uh, early trauma from uh, you know, a, a satanic wannabe, you know, satanic sexual ritual abuse. And then we have Rosemary's Baby, the movie and the book. In 1988, there was a book, Satan's Underground. All of these things created uh, uh, a, a kind of hysteria where there was this great concern about satanic ritual abuse. The interesting thing was that the vast, vast, vast majority of these cases, when they were investigated, there was little to nothing to support it. Few had even heard of satanic ritual abuse before this happened. Then we have one of the most tragic incidents really in history, the McMartin Preschool trial. This was uh, one of the books, and if you're not familiar with that case, in 1983, this was uh, unbelievable, a teacher, was child, a, a teacher in a preschool was charged with molesting a child. Now, the case initially didn't go anywhere because there wasn't a lot of evidence to support it. However, the chief of police uh, took it upon himself to send a letter to parents saying, well, even though this individual was not, uh, uh, we're not going to charge him, uh, you know, you, you better be careful because we do have some concerns that something may have happened. Well, that unleashed it. And I'm going to read you something, one of the accounts of what happened thereafter. As word sped around, your child may have been a victim of abuse. Under the pressure of questions by parents, child abuse experts, and police, the children eventually began to tell tales of abuse. As time passed, the stories became unbelievable. They claimed that they had seen mutilations, murders, dead and burned babies, they saw movie stars involved with the abuse, flying witches, local politicians. Children said that they were forced to engage in satanic rituals, including the drinking of blood. They were taken to airports to be flown to other cities for this. Sometimes they used airplanes and sometimes hot air balloons. Children were flushed down toilets, traveled by sewer. You get the idea. When all was said and done, there was virtually no evidence that this occurred. Well, it's kind of interesting because um, one of the things that you hear from time to time, 
not very often, but I should say that there are some, there are some, not many, but there are some in the UFO community and there are a number of people outside of the UFO community who believe that Satan may very, be, uh, very well be involved with these abductions, that these so-called aliens are really demonic entities. And as I said, most people don't even give that a second thought. But I might just throw something out at you parenthetically. This was a book written by Nick Redfern called Final Events. He talks a little bit about this hypothesis that not just uh, uh, these uh, aliens, quote unquote, but even ties it into the UFO phenomena in general, could have some type of tie-in with Satan. I don't want to get into it up here, it's very complicated, but it's a, let's put it like this, it is thought provoking. Let's get back to our hysteria here. Now we have another situation here. Dissociative identity disorder, formerly uh, known as multiple personality, we have a similar situation. Practically unheard of, we certainly had some cases, and then in the 1970s, you'll excuse the expression, all hell broke loose for a number of different reasons. One of the reasons, wh whoops, sorry, was the um, movie and the book Sybil. Sybil was a story of a woman who ostensibly had 16 different personalities. Um, uh, they, they made a movie, Sally Field was in the starting role. Uh, a lot of my students say, oh, I know about Sybil, yeah, it was a fascinating case. Well, unfortunately, a lot of students don't know about another book called Sybil Exposed, the extraordinary story behind the famous multiple personality case by investigative reporter Debbie Nathan. And based on Debbie Nathan's investigation of the Sybil case, it is at best iatrogenic and most likely purely fraudulent. And yet, all of these cases of multiple personality, we went from several hundred pre-Sybil to thousands and thousands post-Sybil. Workshops on uh, multiple personality, courses on multiple personality, experts on multiple personality. Uh, in 1992, Shepherd Pratt Hospital, a local hospital, um, hired a expert in multiple personality disorder and the number of cases increased by 900 percent after that time. And of course in 1980 multiple personality was officially recognized by the American Psychiatric Association so insurance companies insurance companies would reimburse uh, the psychiatrist was happy, Big Pharma was happy you know so how does this relate to alien abductions? Well, we just uh, heard uh, Dr. Westrom talk about uh, Whitley Strieber, uh, David Jacobs, uh, um, uh, um, Bud Hopkins. Uh, we have movies, Close Encounters. We have, it became part of our cultural awareness, cultural cognizance, and then when these books came out, when it became a culturally became more culturally aware of it, then what did we have? We have cases now of alien abductions. And then a similar type of scenario. As he said, you have support groups, you have experts, you have conferences. All of a sudden, you've got hybrids, you've got reptilians, you've got alien, uh, alien, half alien, half human babies. To mental health professionals, this was, as Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again. Here we go again, it's just another type of hysteria. So from what I've said so far, you might say, well, gee, well, why bother? What's the point? Why even, even consider this? Why even to look in this? If there is so little of substance which supports the veridicality, one might argue so far, uh, by what so much of what is written and spoken and presented, certainly at least in the popular press, Um, and then why bother to look into this? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, there are some very, very uh, highly respected, very credible scientific researchers that study this, and we've heard from two of them this evening. Also, there are some good and scholarly uh, work out there. Well, there we go. 
These are two uh, books, uh, Varieties of Anomalous Experience. And I mentioned this book. This book is not specifically about alien abductions. Uh, this book is about a, well, what it says, a variety of anomalous experiences. And yes, it is a play on words memorializing uh, William James' classic varieties of religious experiences. It talks about a number of different topics, including some that we've heard here this weekend. And one of them was uh, one of the articles written by the esteemed uh, Stanley Krippner that we heard this, this morning. Talks about anomalous hearing, uh, healing. Uh, but one of the, um, one of the uh, chapters has to do with alien abductions, and written by psychologists. And they very carefully uh, look at some of the more popular hypotheses, fantasy-prone personality, psychopathology, sleep paralysis, etc. The interesting thing about the chapter on abductions is that if you read the chapter very carefully, they don't really come to a conclusion. They really can't definitively say what's going on. They basically say that some of these hypotheses, some of these hypotheses may ex explain, you know, uh, some accounts, but no hypothesis really explains all of these accounts of abductions. So um, this is a, a book, The Abduction Enigma, written by a psychologist, a medical doctor. It tends to be anti-abduction, but I think it's worth reading, and I think it's also been sort of misunderstood. Um, uh, that it, I, I think what it does is to talk about the importance of being very careful researchers you know, you should rule out such things as sleep paralysis, uh, such things as, uh, um, you know, uh, hallucinations. You should rule these things out before we start assuming that it's people are being abducted. So it looks like we're, <laughs> um, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to move on a little bit. I want to talk about me and I want to talk about uh, one of the cases that, uh, uh, I want to discuss a little bit this evening. So you sort of see where I'm com coming from. So I was sort of skeptical about this whole issue. In the 1970s, uh, mid-1970s, I worked for a while as a, dare I say this, as a bartender at uh, Bowling Air Force Base in Washington, D.C., what used to be called Bowling Field. And one night I was tending bar, and this gentleman came in, and he had a very distinct southern accent, and I asked him where he was from. And he says, well, I'm from a little town called Pascagoula in Mississippi. Well, I was aware of this Pascagoula case, this Pascagoula abduction case that occurred back in October of 1973. There are a lot of abduction cases. Some are more compelling than others. On the surface, the Pascagoula abduction case is the most inane, the most ridiculous, the silliest, got a couple of good old boys out there going fishing one night. Uh, all of a sudden, they, they uh, hear this uh, zipping sound. They turn around. They see this blue ship there. And uh, they get into this ship, and they report being abducted. And this, this eye contraption uh, supposedly circled around them. And they went out and uh, you know uh, ended up uh, talking to the police and the military. So this, this gentleman at the, at the bar was actually a police officer in Pasigula, Mississippi. And he was at a bowling uh, Air Force Base on, I guess he was, he was in the reserves. So I met him, and I interviewed him, and we spent some time together. And he said some interesting things to me about the, one of the two gentlemen involved with the case, Charlie Hickson, he was 42. He said to me, he said, did you know that Charles Hickson was a war hero? And I said, no. He said, did you know that Charles Hickson passed the polygraph test? And I said, no. Did you know the case was taken very seriously by Air Force personnel at Keesler Air Force Base? I said, no. <laughs> he, said, he says, I know Charlie Hickson. He says, I've worked with the, with the man. He says, these stories of him having a drinking problem are uh, exaggerated. He's not prone to fantasy. And he says he was, he was, I guess he still was at that time, but he had been a member of the Pasigula Police Department, and he was involved with the case. And he said to me that his um, colleagues on the police department, almost to a person, 
were convinced that Hickson and the 19-year-old friend, Calvin Parker, were telling the truth. And he said to me, did you know that they were secretly tape recorded? And I said, well, I heard tell about that, but they must have known they were being tape recorded. And this police officer said to me, his name was Bill Gennaro, he says, I can assure you, I worked for the Pascagoula Police Department, they did not know they were being tape recorded. This happened shortly after the abduction. Now what I have here, and I, don't, I hope we can show it, um, is the actual, this is not a reproduction, this is the actual tape recording of Charlie Hickson, age 42, and Calvin Parker, age 19, um, after they went to the, to the uh, police department uh, and they were placed, they weren't arrested, but they were placed in this room alone. The officers left them alone, figuring they're gonna say, oh, we pulled a fast one over him, didn't we? Well, that's not exactly what, what they found. Basically, these two guys are talking about really being horrified, being frightened. Nobody's going to believe us. Uh, what are we going to do? You know, they, there was no evidence that they were lying. Now, this police officer, uh, this whole thing kind of really thank you, piqued my curiosity. So there's Hickson and Parker. So let's, uh, let's fast forward to 2003. 30th anniversary of the Pascagoula abduction case, I was giving a talk at a uh, seminar called Mysteries of Space and Sky, and I decided to talk about this case. And what I did was to have a series of interviews with Charlie Hickson. And I have to tell you, uh, I had a series of interviews with Charlie, got to know him somewhat well, and I was convinced that this man was telling the truth. I am convinced, as was J. Allen Hynek, who interviewed him, that he had an experience. Do not believe this man was lying. I believe the man was very honorable. So if this case, which on the surface would be sort of the most ridiculous, the most inane, what does that say or suggest about some other cases that may be much more compelling and, if you will, believable, such as the Travis Walton case? So, there's a picture of uh, Charlie uh, holding a sketch of, of he and, and Calvin with the, with the uh, UFO. Now, I don't, haven't had a chance to do this, to do this uh, justice, but suffice it to say that my uh, opportunity to get to know this man changed my attitude about abductions so that it's much more open-minded now. And again, I ended up working with some people who claim to have been abductions, abducted. And then finally, uh, you know, the theme of this conference is making connections. I'm going to give you a chance to make some connections with other people interested in this field with a shameless plug. October 24, 2015, we're not going to be talking about Charlie Hickson, but we are going to be talking about mysteries of space and sky. We're going to be hearing from Rob Switek, his wife Sue, 
Um, um, in, in the lobby out there, have some flyers. I also have some here that will talk about it. I hope that you folks will make some connections in considering uh, coming, attending the conference. Uh, the flyers have all the information you, that you uh, need to know about the conference. I'll also be hanging around and tell you what I know uh, about it so far. Um, sorry for the sort of the helter-skelter address here, but I will leave you with one final sentiment. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. I agree with you about the Hicks and Parker case. Uh, it, it is, I mean, it's really hard to disprove that. But the thing that makes it so ridiculous, in spite of all the evidence, is the fact they're, they're not out in the woods or on some distant lake. I mean, they're in an area in Pascagoula that was fairly well populated. They were on the bank of a river. I, I think it was off an old fishing pier or something like that. And then this craft just appears and opens its doors. Uh, and uh, these aliens float out and float them into it, into this craft, and then keep them for about a half an hour. Now. The hard part to believe is, you know, where, where was everybody else? Wasn't anybody seeing this craft? Was it interdimensional? You know, just that, that's the part, of course, about this whole phenomena is the way these things appear and then disappear. But everything about their story holds true to me, it seems to, to be. Well, yeah, and, and my skepticism of this case also was because this is, we didn't have the traditional gray alien. We had this weird looking mummy here. but. What I discovered from Office in Janeiro and what I discovered in subsequent evaluations and, and, and research on this case is in fact, at that time, there was a wave of UFO sightings in and around Pascagoula. And some of these reports did, the reporters did say they saw something down by that uh, Shalpeter uh, uh, shipyard close to where the, um, uh, the incident took place. So there were some reports uh, ultimately, that ultimately came out that said, yeah, we saw something down in that same area. But the police officer that I had a chance to interview said that there were sightings all over Pasigula at that time, including one that he had. And of course, October of 1973 was part of the big flap year for UFOs in the so-called year of the humanoid. Last question? Yes, sir. Hi, Peter. Uh You've mentioned the kind of argument we've heard for many decades that talking about this more openly in the media would cause mass hysteria going back to the war of the worlds. And that, we're familiar with that argument, but as a clinical social worker, what about the flip side of this, of the stress of a person who's experienced this but can't talk about it, maybe because they are served in an official capacity and they only talk about it on their deathbed or something like that? And I'll give you an example. Two years ago in Washington, D.C., we had the citizen hearing, which someone mentioned with uh, Stephen Bassett, where we had 40 witnesses over five days at the National Press Club giving testimony under sworn oath to six retired Congress people, including a senator. We had four retired missile control launch officers who each told us similar stories of flying disks coming over their bases and all of uh, maybe sometimes 10 to 15 missiles going down at the same time. And later on, people would come into the base, have them sign something saying, nothing happened, and you won't talk about what never happened. And there was one particular individual there, his name was David Schindler. He was shaking when he was talking about this because he couldn't decide whether to come to this event until the last moment, because he was breaking his security oath to talk about something that was seen by many people serving at the base. Uh, he was told by one of the Congress people that he could testify because they were, had been in Congress. And it became a question of if this was actually even legal to have this type of testimony given the security oath he had signed. In any case, the media were there, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the Washington Post editorial had a story about this. And we were curious to see if they reported it seriously or not. And they said, after covering this just superficially that they had talked to a psychiatrist and this was a form of schizotypal mental disorder. Now the last time I checked, SAC radar doesn't have schizotypal mental disorder. You know, radar is highly calibrated. It's not a, it's not a credible argument when you have so much data 
air radar, ground radar, multiple sightings to call this a schizotypal mental disorder. So I think we need to move forward past that point and really deal with the evidence because quite frankly, I'm concerned that there could be hundreds or thousands of people out there in our society, let alone the Soviet Union where we know this sort of incident has also happened with their nuclear missiles that can't talk about it and they tell their kids as they're about to die, we should hear about it here, not at the end of their life. Thank you. Well, I think you're, I mean, it's hard to, to, to top that. You're absolutely right, but I just, to sort of piggyback it, um, research shows that the vast majority of these so-called abductees, psychopathology does not explain their experience. It simply doesn't. It may explain some of them, but psychopathology does not explain it. Hoaxing does not explain it. Again, it may explain some, but not most of them. These people are found to be um, not psychotic and um, not faking, and most of them. And you're right. I've had um, a gentleman that I saw that lived in northern Pennsylvania that came all the way down to see me in Prince George's County, which you don't know where that is. It's on the south end of D.C. Came down to see me several times. Uh, for individual therapy to talk about his experiences uh, because he says he, he doesn't, can't tell anybody else because anybody he talks to, it's the usual, you're lying, uh, you're crazy, it's the devil, and he couldn't talk to anybody else. I finally let him know that David Jacobs was closer to home. Couldn't talk about it with anyone. There was another case that was actually referred to me by the Switex uh, of a woman who um, had abduction experiences in a segment of her life, told no one Told, did not tell her husband, did not tell her closest friend who she's had lunch with every month since she, they were in high school, and she felt like she's getting older now. Uh, she doesn't want to go to her deathbed and tell no one. So she called uh, Fufor, I guess, and uh, the Switex come to find out this lady is, lives in walking distance to my house. And I saw her a number of times. And um, like you say, she, she hadn't told anyone, and she felt like, I got to tell someone. So you're right, it's a big problem, because people who have these experiences, they ain't talking, so many of them. So we're what's the real incidence or prevalence? Who knows, because so many don't, don't, don't want to admit it, because again, you're lying, you're crazy, it's the devil. Thank you very much, Peter.